Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. In our Journey to Easter series, today's message is on the Garden of Gethsemane. We will be looking at Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. If you'd like to follow along with the sermon notes, you can download them now from calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. We're continuing our journey to Easter and Luke 22 is where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. There are Bibles in the seats around you. Reach down there, grab one of those, turn to page 1048. That's page 1048. You'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, Take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have a Bible. We want you to read it. If you're joining us online uh, and you don't have a Bible and you want one, message us. We'll be glad to get you a Bible, uh, whether we mail it to you or deliver it to you. Uh, we would love for you to have God's Word because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, just wanted to give you guys a, an update on Limitless. Uh, we, you know, about a week and a half ago, we finished up our last dinners. Uh, we had five of them in six nights. We've been talking about Limitless for a while. And I just want you to know, to date, uh, we have 371 pledges, uh, 3.15 million pledged uh, to Limitless. Yeah, it's something to celebrate. <laughs> Some of you are like, is that all? <laughs> you can make it more. Uh, and... Uh, Hey, if you meant to, wanted to, planned to, intended to pledge, and you didn't get a chance to do that, there are pledge cards available at the Welcome Centers. You can walk by, pick one up, fill it out, drop it in the offering box. Some people ask me, do we have to pledge to give? Oh, no, you can give without pledging. It's a whole lot better than pledging without giving. Uh, so uh, just uh, you can find uh, Limitless on, your, on our website, uh, on our uh, giving app. Uh, through the website, so you can give that way. You can mark building on the envelopes. Uh, we will uh, be glad to apply that. But this is uh, continuing in motion, and in a few weeks, you'll start seeing that in your bulletin, so we won't be announcing it all the time, including how much money has come in. So I just want to praise God for the 371 families right now that have said this is a commitment we want to help build so that we can reach this community and Parker with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Hey, have you ever been in a store or in a restaurant or in a public place and a child, usually a toddler, just has a meltdown? <laughs> you know, have you ever seen it where they drop to the floor kicking and screaming and crying and shouting and just throwing a complete temper tantrum because they didn't get their way? You ever seen that? Ever been there? Okay. So in those moments when you see that, I think we, we think similar things. Now, the worst part of us, let's just go ahead and, we're talking about confession. Let's just go ahead and talk about that. The worst part of us, you know, are thinking things like, those parents better learn how to discipline now or else the teenage years are going to be brutal. <laughs> right? Anybody? Anyone want to confess? Yeah. Or some of us are thinking, just give me five minutes with that child. I'll give them something to cry about. <laughs> Come on, go ahead and confess. Go ahead. Okay. See those hands. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're just being honest here. Now, the better part of us is thinking, oh, this is poor parents. I hope they, I hope they hold, you know, hold out there. Don't, don't give in to that. Uh, and and some, of them, some of us, I don't know if it's a better thing or not, but we're just going, praise God, it's not me this time. <laughs> right? Anyone ever thought, oh, I'm just glad, yeah, it's not my child. Uh, throwing that temper tantrum. Now, has anyone ever thought this? You looked at the child and you went, I know just how you feel. <laughs> anyway, okay, there's a couple, of the, a couple of you are like, yeah, I, I want to do that too, but no one will let me. <laughs> right? I mean, and some of you are going, what? You don't really think that, do you? Yeah. I think we can all relate to that child because if we don't get our way or if we have to do something we don't want to do, uh, we feel like them. We just know as adults, we can't, drop to the floor kicking and screaming and it doesn't do any good anyway, right? Some of, some of you are going, yes, we can, and I've done it. All right, All right. well, uh, hey, this is where Scripture takes us today on our journey to Easter. You see, we get to see Jesus in an uncomfortable moment when he didn't get his way. And we learn what it looks like 
to follow Jesus. Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 39. Now, if you missed last week, Jesus and the disciples, they celebrated the Last Supper. They were celebrating Passover, and Jesus initiated what we call the Lord's Supper or communion with his disciples. We celebrated communion last week. And so uh, then they left there and they traveled to the Mount of Olives. And it says this, verse 39. And Jesus came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. And he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when Jesus rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, this is the picture of the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is on his way to the crucifixion. He knows that. He's aware of that. He understands the Father's plan, and he's wrestling with it. And as we see this, I want to just share four observations from the Garden of Gethsemane with us and, and, and these are observations I hope you will think about, I hope you will pray about, I hope that you will discuss them in your life group, over dinner, uh, wherever you may be. And, and I hope that you and the Holy Spirit will wrestle a little bit this week about these observations. Now, first of all, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we observe the agony of obedience. The agony of obedience. Verse 42, just the first half of it says, Jesus prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. If you are willing. Look, we know we are supposed to obey God. I mean, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, personal you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then, then you know that Jesus expects us to obey him. And he even said that in the Gospel of John. He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. If you love me, you'll do what I say. If you love me, you, you will follow my teachings and apply them to your life. And, and so sometimes I just want you to know that it is agonizing for us to obey. It, it, it is. I mean, it was for Jesus in the garden. It becomes clear to us that Jesus doesn't want to die. Okay, he, he, that, that's not his desire in that moment. Uh, he prays, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. If you are willing, don't make me suffer and die on the cross. Is there another way? And, and it even says in verse 44 that being in agony. I mean, look, mo none of us know the, the when and where and how we're going to die. When I talk to people who are, are, are approaching death, they're like, I just don't want it to hurt so much. Anybody with me on that one? They're like, I wanna, can we go in our sleep? You know. Uh, I, I mean, and, that, and, and there's a lot of those prayers, and Jesus is looking at this, and he knows in a few hours I'm going to be tortured, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be spat upon, I'm going to be humiliated, and I'm going to suffer an agonizing death. And he didn't want to do it. And that begs the question for us, how are we going to respond when God takes us where we don't want to go? How are we going to respond when God asks us to do something we don't want to to do? What are we going to say when God challenges us and asks us to change our life and our plans and our habits? You see, Jesus obeyed. He did it reluctantly. He did it in agony, but he obeyed the Father. So I just want you to know that following Jesus isn't easy. Following Jesus isn't easy. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, Jesus said, If anyone is going to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come follow me. 
doesn't really sound pleasant, does it? Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and come follow me. And, and sometimes we can be guilty of overselling the idea that following Jesus is going to make everything okay. It's going to be sunshine and roses, and he's going to change your life. He's going to fill your life with love and peace. And all that is true. I mean, the truth is that Jesus will heal. He will redeem. He will restore. He will change your life for the better. But uh, he also calls us to a life of self-denial. He also tells us we have to take up a cross, an instrument of torture and pain, not a piece of jewelry that we wear. And this is difficult. This is Jesus challenging us. And look, I want everyone to follow Jesus. I mean, this whole ministry is predicated on this idea that we want everyone to follow Jesus. Jesus is the only way that you can be saved. Jesus is the only way that you're gonna have eternal life. He's the only one who can take you to heaven, okay? He is it. So we want you to follow Jesus. But God asks his children to do difficult things. And we need to be honest about that. Walking into this, and, and by the way, God spells some of those difficult things out in Scripture for us in black and white that we can open the book and we can read and we can wrestle with. Like, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. That's not easy. Or how about, <laughs> bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Or what about be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other as God in Christ has forgiven you? Or how about it's more blessed to give than to receive? Or how about just the reality that he wants us to endure and, and endure with hope, no matter what it is? Or just rejoice always. Or if any of you wants to be great, he must become the servant of everyone. You see, the, time after time after time, the word of God challenges the way that we want to live our lives. And, and, and God says, look, this is the path and I'm gonna ask you to do this. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the agony of obedience. It's clear. And we also observe the danger of temptation. The danger of temptation. This passage is bookended with a warning. Look at verse 40 as, as Jesus begins. It says, when he came to the place, he said to them, his disciples, the guys who'd been traveling with him for all this time, 11 of them anyway, because Judas is off running around betraying him, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then the last thing he says, verse 46, rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Twice in just a few verses in this period of time, Jesus tells his disciples, we're his disciples, you need to pray that you do not enter into temptation. So we need to understand the danger of temptation. By the way, Jesus says prayer is the key to overcoming temptation. I don't know if you noticed that. Pray that you would not enter into temptation. Twice he says that. You need to be praying. Why does Jesus tell us to pray? Well, because prayer is talking to God. Okay, when somebody says, you know, why don't you lead us in prayer, you say, fine, I'll talk to the Father for us. That's just all it is. So when we encourage you to pray, it's just have a conversation with God. And when you talk with God, you get closer to God and, and you help to know God and trust him more. And see, if we're communicating with God, then we're less likely to disobey God. Does that make sense? Okay, so if, if uh, some of you are convinced, others of you are like, all right, what, what are you trying to get at? This is, this is the proximity principle. The closer you are to God, the less likely you are to disobey God. Okay, the proximity principle. Let me just do it this way. How many of you drive cars? Okay, how many of you ever drive above the posted speed limit? Okay, how many of you do it regularly like me? <laughs> That's a lot of you, okay. So, um, so we're all, we're all guilt, you know, guilty of breaking the speed limit, you know, at least sometimes, because almost everyone raised their hand and says, I've never, you know, not, you know, ever gone above the speed limit. So when you are driving, whether you're going to the speed limit or above the speed limit, and you see a law enforcement vehicle, what is it that you do? Are you guys, you guys laugh? No, what do you do? 
Yeah, you, we all slow down, right? You let off the gas, you tap the brake, you look down and see how fast am I going? But I'm following people driving the speed limit, which is always annoying. And uh, <laughs> look, I'll confess. And, uh, and then they see a police officer and they slow down. And I'm like, why are you slowing down? You're not even speeding. <laughs> it's because we all feel guilty. And we see the police car and we're like, oh, I gotta slow down. I don't wanna get a ticket. You understand that? Proximity encourages obedience. It is not knowledge, because we all know what the speed limit is, and we still choose to dis disregard it. And yet when you see a police car, you are suddenly inspired <laughs> to check the speed limit and to slow down. That's the proximity principle. And I'm just telling you, if you talk with God on a regular basis, if you are close with God in your communion with him, then you are less likely to be breaking the law of God. You're less likely to be living in disobedience. It's because you're close to him. And, and we need to be close to him because each one of us faces temptation. Temptation is a reality. It's the temptation to simply do what we want instead of what God wills. It's the temptation to avoid the pain, to take the easy path, to be selfish, to keep the money, to hold the grudges, to refuse to forgive, to just hate our opponents or be proud. That's the easy way. And that's why Jesus tells us to pray so that we don't enter into temptation. That's why the Apostle Paul says pray continually. Okay, old school, pray without ceasing right? Pray throughout the day so that you stay close to Jesus, so that you can resist the temptation. And, and we need to pray that we do not enter into temptation because we are weak people. We're weak. I, I mean, Jesus saw that with his disciples. Verse 45, when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. Sleeping. I mean, Jesus said, hey, watch and pray with me. He invited them to pray for him. He knew the most challenging part of his life was coming up, and he asked his closest friends to pray for him, and they fell asleep. Have you ever been so tired when you were praying that you fell asleep? Okay, I'm not talking about in bed at night. I'm talking about like in a prayer meeting. Okay. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, a few of you have. Okay. I'm not talking about when I'm preaching. I'm talking about when you're like with some people and you're like, let's pray. We were on a mission trip coming, one time coming back and we said, oh, let's pray. And we seriously, half the group fell asleep while we were praying. It's a bad idea. And it was mine. So the disciples were weak. They were tired. They were emotionally exhausted. And they weren't prepared for the temptation that was to come. What was that? Because when Judas showed up and Jesus was betrayed and arrested, what did they do? They ran away. They were afraid and they ran away. Why? Because they weren't prepared for the temptation. You see, we are weak. I'm weak. You're weak. Not, not past tense like I used to be weak. No, it's, this is present tense. I am weak. That means we are vulnerable to temptation. So please know your weaknesses. Protect yourself through praying, through reading the Bible, through life group participation, through accountability and serving. And for your sake, avoid the dangerous places. When I say dangerous, I mean the tempting places. Um, sometimes we put ourselves in a place where it's easy to give in to temptation. So here, I'm just gonna pick on the guys for a moment. So if, uh, uh, if you're a guy, then you struggle with lust. Notice I didn't ask you how many of you struggle with lust because I don't want some of you to lie right now. Uh, so lust is a part of, of the, your, your struggle, your, your temptation of the flesh. So you ought to avoid the channel on holiday weekends. Okay? Some of you are like, well, that's not fair. I'm just telling you. If it's a reality that you're gonna be tempted with your eyes, then you just need to go, hey, I need to stay away from that. I don't need to see that. I, don't, I need to avoid the dangerous places and you need to avoid the dangerous people. We all have those friends. You know, the ones with the bad ideas? And, and they'll try to get you to go along with them on the bad ideas? 
That's why Proverbs just simply counsels us. The one who walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. Sometimes you just need to go, I don't need to be with them right now because I'm not ready to resist the temptation. So in the garden, we see the agony of obedience. We see the danger of temptation and we observe the strength from God. The strength from God. Verse 43, it says, and there appeared to Jesus an angel from heaven strengthening him. I mean, in the midst of Jesus' anguish, the father sent an angel now, does anyone else think that's really cool? Anybody? I mean, have you ever been in a place in your life where you're like, I could use an angel showing up right now? Right? I mean, it's just like, hey, that is awesome. See, and by the way, I'm absolutely certain in our darkest moments in life, God's messengers show up. It's not always obvious to us, but God is with us, and he is sending people to strengthen us. Uh, but I want you to notice this. The angel encouraged Jesus, he didn't rescue him. Let that sink in for a minute. The angel encouraged Jesus, but he did not rescue him. Jesus continued in his agony. He continued struggling with the cost of obedience. Jesus asked the Father for another way. If it's possible, remove this cup from me. And the Father said, no, but I'll encourage you and I'll strengthen you for the moment. So often in our dark moments, we cry out to God to rescue us from the pain, from the sorrow, from the despair, or from the agony that we are facing. And we are often disappointed and angry when God offers strength, but refuses to rescue us. Because we want God to rescue us. And we say things like, God, if you loved me, you would help me out of this. If you loved me, you would fix this. If you would love me, you would heal them. God says, I love you, but I'm going to treat you just like I did my son. See, the problem is we want to be treated better than God treated his one and only son. God sent someone to strengthen Jesus, not to rescue Jesus. So I'm just going to tell you today, God will give you strength for the battle that you're facing. Whatever that battle is, he sees your struggle, he is with you, and he promises to never abandon you. God will see you through the battle that he's not gonna rescue you from the battle. So see the strength from God because in the garden we see the strength provided by God, the danger of temptation, the agony of obedience, and we can observe the victory achieved through submission. Let's go back to verse 42, the one everyone remembers. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. The prayer does not end there. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, Jesus achieved victory when he embraced the Father's will over his own. Let's say that again. Jesus achieved victory when he embraced God's will over his own. Now, he didn't realize the victory until his final breath on the cross when he cried out, it is finished. A victory cry when he said, the atonement of the world is done through my sacrificial death. It is finished. He didn't publicize his victory until the resurrection. Right? Easter morning, Jesus walks out of the tomb. We already sang about that. Walked out of the grave. And and the world knew that he was alive and that he had defeated sin and death and hell. So the victory was realized on the cross. It was publicized from the tomb. But the battle was decided in the garden as Jesus submits to the Father's will. Not my will. Not what I want. But what you want. So I got to ask you this question. In life, do you want to win? Yes. (laughs) One. That's good. What are the rest of us aspiring to? I just want to tie. I don't really want to win. Um, So do you want to win? Okay, well. Then if you want to win, if you want to be victorious, if you want to be champions, the only way to victory in your life is surrendering to God's plan. 
All right, I'm just going to repeat that. The only way to victory in your life is surrendering to God's plan, choosing God's path, submitting to God's will. There is no other path to victory. Until we can honestly pray, Father, you know what I want. You know what my heart desires. You know what my preferences are. But nevertheless, not what I want, not my will, but your will be done. If, if we don't get to that point, we're not gonna experience the victory. We're not gonna achieve the success in our spiritual lives because we're gonna keep usurping God's plan and short-circuiting the victory that he has planned for us. Um, but see, we can only submit to God's will when we trust God and trust his promises. You know how you learn God's promises? You know how you learn to trust him? You read and apply God's word. And then you see his promises come true in your life. You see the principles come true in your life and you get to know those and you start trusting God. And you go, I God, I can trust you even when it's hard. We can only submit to God's will when we trust God with our lives and our careers and our happiness. In other words, happiness means, God, I wanna be happy, but um, you tell me to do this, but I feel like doing that. Okay, I'm gonna do it your way. So many of us go, God, I wanna please you, but I wanna be happy doing it, and we think happiness is gonna come from our choices, and our choices for happiness lead to shipwreck lives. We just crash on the rocks of disappointment and despair. Why? Because we're doing the opposite of what God is calling us to do. You see, we can only submit to God's will when we trust God with our marriages, our children, and their lives. Again, some of us think that, you know, the, the marriage and the world and our kids should all work our ways and what we want so that they will make us happy. And, and we're crushing our marriages and we're crushing our children. And God's calling us to trust him with their lives. Again, to do marriage his way, to do relationships his way, to be people of peace and love and hope and encouragement and forgiveness and trust. We can only submit to God's will when we trust God enough to obey when it hurts. To embrace the pain of loss because then we experience the power of the resurrection. It's my joy to lose my life and find it in Jesus Christ. You see, those are the words of Jesus. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses it for my sake, he will find it. And that's the battle of the garden. That's the place of the struggle when we're there with Jesus and we're praying and we're saying, God, uh, I know, here's what I want. But I know you want something different for me. And then we have to make a choice. See, we observe Jesus in the garden. But some of us are living in the garden today. And all I'm going to ask you is, what is God asking you to do and what's your answer going to be? Time after time after time in our lives, we are at this point point of the garden and God is telling us what to do and we know what it is he wants us to do and we have to decide to surrender or to rebel. And, and here's the reality. Every time we choose to rebel, spiritually we're the toddler having the meltdown. We're not going to get what we want and it's not going to end well for us. And it just makes everybody else sad and uncomfortable. So I pray that you choose to submit to God's will, whatever that is in your life. Because if you're his child right now, then the Holy Spirit is nudging you. He's nudging you to pray like Jesus. Father, if it's possible, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Let's pray. Father, you know this struggle is real in all of our hearts and lives. 
Satan has done such a wonderful job of selling us the path to happiness, the shortcut to success. All the things that he tells us will make us happy simply leave us empty and unfulfilled and broken and despairing. And yet you are the one who offers us life. And we know it, but we still choose to chase after the empty dreams. So God, teach us how to be like Jesus where we can identify what it is we want and we can yield to your will anyway. We can acknowledge how we want to rebel, but we choose obedience. We can acknowledge that we want to be selfish with our time, but we say yes to being servants. We can acknowledge that hatred and anger and unforgiveness that is raging through our hearts, and yet we choose to forgive. God, we can't do that without you. So right now, meet us in this place, in our homes. Let your Holy Spirit speak clearly and loudly in our hearts. And God, our commitment is to say yes because you love us and you gave Jesus to save us. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus experienced agony such that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. He prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Sometimes being obedient to God's instruction is difficult and can be painful, yet God offers strength when we want to be rescued. If you have questions about today's message or would like to speak to a pastor about God's plan for your life, I invite you to email us at questions at calvaryaz.com. One of our pastors will follow up with you and pray with you. That'll do it for today. Have a blessed week and come back to join us next weekend. Bye-bye.